Hey, you know, as we get started in our summer, and, you know, it's been fun today to talk about summer plans and vacations, and maybe most of you kids are out of school, maybe some of you have a week left. I, I just want to encourage you, uh, as we get started into this great summer, to stay connected to your church family. And uh, there are many ways that you can do that, and certainly worshiping with your church family on a Sunday is a big part of that. Uh, but also, if you're on the road and traveling, we... we you to join us online and to worship online with us. Follow along as you can or uh, stay connected to what we're teaching through, uh, whether it be through our podcasts or some of our online uh, teaching videos. Uh, I will tell you that we're starting a brand new teaching series next week. We're going to take a break from Acts. We're starting a new series called Sticky Stories, and we've got some fun elements to go along with that, but for the next few months, uh, we're going to be diving into some of the well-known stories of the Old Testament, stories that we might think, oh, that's an old story. I'm familiar with that story. I've learned everything that I need to know about that story, but just asking the Lord to use those well-known stories in our life in ways that stick and uh, ways that can change us and uh, just asking the Lord to transform us however he would. And kids and students, you know, as we've been talking about, there are plenty of ways to get involved and certainly Crud Wars coming up next week and many student activities all summer. We've got a lot of fun things coming up. So be sure to check some of those out, different activities in the park and some water events will be happening this summer. You can find all of that information on our website. I'd like to encourage you or to continue encouraging you to be proactive in getting connected with people, people that are sitting around you today, but also people maybe that God's put in your life, people in your neighborhood this summer. We've been talking to you about backyard picnics or parties, and uh, we'd encourage you to do that. And I, I know that for many of you, you've got lots of good friends and people that you would normally invite into your backyard, but would you just accept the challenge this summer to think maybe are there some other people that I need to invite into my backyard and people to invite uh, to come meet my friends and to get connected uh, to our church family and to others. And I want to say thank you for your serving. We really appreciate you serving serving with us all summer long uh, as we serve the communities that we've been called to, and thank you for your financial giving as well. We couldn't do what we do without you and, uh, and your faithful gifts, and so thanks for being a part uh, of the great work that God continues to do through our church. If you got a Bible today, I want to invite you to take it and turn to Acts chapter 15. I thought, you know, we're going to do one more. We're going to sneak one more week of Acts in here uh, before we take a break, but I'm going to take just a brief moment with you uh, to share, and specifically from Acts chapter chapter 15 today, uh, about the first 11 verses. And so if you want to turn there in a Bible or if you've got a, a Bible app on your phone, you can do that or you can just listen along as I read. But um, we called it the Old Red Chevy. All right, I, I worked at a uh, home appliance store when I was in high school and college, and we delivered things like refrigerators and dishwashers and washers and dryers to different people's homes. And the company that I worked for had a fleet of vehicles, all right, a fleet of vehicles from which we could go out and, and do delivery. But we had this truck called Old Red Chevy, and it looked like it had been through a couple of world wars, if you would. It, uh, it was rusted. Uh, there was no AC. This is long before the days of power mirrors, and so you really had to get into it to crank those windows down. It, it made a lot of funny noises, but for all of you Chevy lovers out there, you'll be pleased to know it fired up every single time, all right, every time you turned that particular key. And once in a while, again, if all of the trucks were out on delivery, I'd have to take out this truck, this old red Chevy, to go out on a delivery. And I'll never forget one particular Saturday uh, when I was out with it, and it desperately needed more fuel. And so I pulled into this gas station, one that I didn't use normally, an area of town that I wasn't familiar with in Springfield, Illinois. And I really wasn't paying it. I, I really was paying attention. Actually, I was paying attention. Uh, but I grabbed the gas nozzle, and I started filling up this truck. And let's just say that it didn't register with me right away. Like, as I was asking myself, why doesn't this nozzle fit completely into the fuel tank? And really, as I think about it, why is this nozzle green and every other one is red? Now, some of you know where this is going, but here's the case, and for you young drivers out there especially, if the nozzle doesn't fit into the gas tank and it's green, means that it dispenses diesel fuel, all right? And uh, if you've got a truck that only takes unleaded, you're not supposed to fit, uh, put diesel fuel in it. The bottom line is that I put diesel fuel into a truck that only takes unleaded gas, and that's a really, really big problem. And so I panicked, 
You know, I panicked thinking, what in the world am I going to do? First of all, I had to go into the gas station and I had to pay for incorrect gas, which was really pretty humbling to do something like that. But next, and I wouldn't recommend this, there, there just happened to be this long rubber hose in the back of our pickup truck. And so I said I was desperate, right? I stuffed that rubber hose as far as I could down into the tank of the truck. And I, well, I used my mouth to begin siphoning the diesel fuel out of the pickup truck. Any of you ever had a mouthful of diesel fuel before? I, a couple of you. I, I, I don't recommend it, all right? I, I recommend avoiding this. But uh, unfortunately, desperate times call for desperate measures but it didn't work very well, unfortunately. And so I had to radio in and talk to my boss explaining the mistake that I made. He didn't say much, but he just told me, drive the truck back to the shop. And let me just say that the results were quickly very evident as I was driving back. That truck sputtered and popped and trucked, or, you know, chugged and banged all the way back, but I made it, all right? I made it all the way back, and then I had to make that walk into the building to face my boss. And, and here's the facts. I was guilty, all right? There was no one else to blame for what had, had happened. Um, I knew that I could be fired. I knew that I should be fired. I deserved to be yelled at for making such a costly mistake. If anything, I should bear the financial responsibility for the damage that I caused the company and I caused this particular truck. But let me tell you something. Instead of getting what I deserved, my boss, thankfully a godly man who loved Jesus a lot, never yelled, he didn't scold me, and honestly, we never even talked about it ever again. And not only did he forgive me, but he also asked me for the receipt for the gas that I had purchased with my own money, and he insisted on reimbursing me for the gas that he would have otherwise. And just in case you're wondering... Old red Chevy, it wasn't as reliable from that day forward, all right? It never really did fire up the same way ever again. It was never the same. And do you know what? I wasn't the same either because I was the recipient of something beautiful, something that the Bible calls grace. And what's grace? Grace is just simply this. It's unmerited favor. It's, it's a kindness not deserved or earned. What, what did I deserve? I deserved punishment. I, I, I deserve to be involved of some level of justice. Like justice means there's a penalty to pay and therefore I'm held accountable. But grace, on the other hand, grace is undeserving favor toward, towards the unworthy And that's exactly what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. It's because of our sin that I deserve punishment, that we deserve punishment, justice. We deserve death, but thank God for grace. Grace is an essential part of God's character. Grace uh, is closely related to his benevolence, his love and mercy. And to fully understand grace, we have to consider and realize who it is that we are without Christ. Because as Psalm chapter 51 says, we were all born to sin, that we've all been guilty of breaking God's laws, and that means we were formerly enemies of God deserving death, as Paul describes in Colossians chapter 1. We were the unrighteous, as Paul describes in Romans chapter 3 verse 10, meaning we didn't have a way. There is no way to fix yourself or to fix what we've done, but then came grace for us and the person of Jesus Christ. As John chapter 1 reminds us, Jesus came into this world. He was full of grace and truth. And that's why grace is the essence of the gospel. It's the essence of the good news of Jesus Christ because grace gives us victory over sin. It's grace that releases us from our past and it points us towards our future. And it's grace that saves us as the Apostle Paul lays out in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. You may know it. He says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. I'm going to take just a few more minutes with you this morning to remind all of us of the importance of God's grace. Because if you're like me, sometimes I can get caught up into some bad theology 
like a, a theology that says my life is a mess, God must be very disappointed in me, ashamed of me, I need to clean up my act so that I don't disappoint God. Anyone ever act that way, think that way, get caught up in that kind of thinking? We're all guilty at times, I think, of a, of a bad sort of theology, a, a theology that, that threatens to disrupt our lives and to get us thinking about the wrong things. Well, this kind of bad theology was threatening to disrupt the mission of the early church we've been studying in Acts. And in case you're new with us today, We've been studying all year long the New Testament book of Acts. It's a history book that begins with the ascension of Jesus in in Acts chapter 1, and then the next 27 chapters detail the first days and years of the church faithfully sharing the good news of Jesus with others. Now, the early followers of Jesus in the book of Acts were fueled by two things, not diesel fuel, but they were were fueled by, first, the, the power of the Holy Spirit that was in them, and as somebody pointed out to me, just a moment ago, today's Pentecost Sunday, all right, and so we, we celebrate the arrival of the Holy Spirit. It was that power of the Holy Spirit in them that fueled them in those early days, but secondly, these early followers, many of them had also witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, if you experience something like that personally, it's going to change you. It's going to motivate your life. Well, wherever these people went, no matter who they encountered, they shared the good news of Jesus, the message of God's grace, but unfortunately, they hit a speed bump and Acts chapter 15, as questions were starting to be raised about salvation, questions and doubts began to surface about who's really worth it when it comes to God's love, and so some bad theology was creeping into the church. Let me read for you Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Here's what we read. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you're circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you can't be saved. Let me point out something really important to us. Anytime you hear a message preached that claims it's Jesus plus something, that's bad theology, all right? That's bad math. But but, but I don't blame these people completely because these were Jews who had grown up in a system of belief, a belief system that required things like circumcision and rule following, but all of that changed with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Like Jesus did what we could never do. He lived a perfect life and paid a price that we could never pay, but that must have been difficult for some of them to grasp. Because when you think about it, that really is the the funny, controversial thing about grace. It is too good to be true. It can be tough to accept and to receive into your life. Verse 2, this brought Paul and Barnabas into a sharp dispute and debate with these these teachers. So, So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. Now, people like Paul and Barnabas were passionate about the gospel of Jesus. It was shaping every part of their lives. Again, the good news of God's grace and helping people find their way back to God. And so they're off to a meeting. They're sent really as a delegation back to the, to the church leaders in Jerusalem really to make sure they're gonna get this right, to make sure the church doesn't get sideways when it comes to this grace issue. Verse four, when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. And so they've arrived, they get there, there's this important meeting taking place, and here's the number one agenda item on the table, verse 5. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said the Gentiles, or anyone that's not Jewish, must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. And so that's the issue at stake. Basically, it's got to be more than grace. It can't be just grace. It can't just be Jesus. It has to be Jesus plus something. Verse 6, the apostles and elders then met to consider this question. Verse 7, after much discussion, which would really be better translated as intense debate, Peter got up and addressed them. And here's what he said. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able 
to bear. In other words, Peter basically says this, the law of God had a specific purpose and for a specific period of time, but then Jesus came and accomplished what we could never accomplish on our own. There was no sin in his life. He fulfilled the requirements of the law and he did it perfectly. And in essence, Peter says, if Jesus did that for us, why would we now turn back to a way of living that only pronounces in the end that everyone is guilty when the good news of Jesus Christ means that we are free? The good news of Jesus Christ means that there is grace that Jesus did what we could never do and his life and his salvation are a gift and through faith in him, we are free and through faith in him, we are saved. And then Peter states, and thank God that these early leaders were able to discern and preserve the essence of the good news of Jesus Christ because it doesn't get any better than this verse 11. Peter says, no, we believe that it is through the grace of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we are saved. See, friends, grace changes everything. Grace saves us through faith, as the Apostle Paul declares, that you and I, we can't save ourselves. There's there's no amount of good or right that you or I can do to make ourselves right with God, but then grace, it's the grace of Jesus. His grace for me, his grace for you, his grace for all, It's available to all through faith in him. And the truth of God's grace means just this. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how old or how young or what you've done in your life. It doesn't matter your successes or your failures. It doesn't matter how rich you are or poor you are. There is no one. There's no one, no matter how religious, no matter how repulsive, there is no one in this world, there is no one here today who isn't in desperate need for the incredible work of God's grace through Jesus Christ. Paul David Tripp says this about it. He says that when it comes to the grace of God, no one is rejected, no one is omitted, no one is left out, everyone is alike, all live the same drama, and all of us have but one hope, and that is the grace of Jesus, that it has the power to change you and everything about you and me. He says grace explodes into our lives in a moment, but then occupies us for the rest of eternity. Grace is why God sent Jesus. Jesus did for us what we could never do for ourselves to change us from the sinners we were into what we're becoming, and what we're becoming is more and more like Jesus Christ each and every day. And then Paul David Tripp says this. He says, if you will let it, Grace will blow up your little kingdom of one while it introduces you to a much better, more glorious king. Grace will work to expose your blindness while it gives you eyes to see. Grace will drive you to the end of yourself while it holds before you the promise of fresh starts and new beginnings. And God's word for us, as the Apostle Paul says again in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, is that for it is by grace that we've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Grace is a person. And that person for us is Jesus Christ. And he's available to you and me today. And his grace is good for you this morning if you feel lost right now. His grace is good and perfect for you if you're stuck. It's, his grace is greater than the worst sin you've ever committed in your life. It's, it, it can save your life. It can save your marriage. It has the power to heal. It has the power to restore. It has the power to, to restore our faith. It's his grace that leads us to repentance and obedience And most importantly, it's his grace that saves. We are saved by grace. Faith is the only thing we can bring to the table. In his famous hymn, John Newton really did choose the best word to describe it. He says, it's amazing. It truly is amazing. And we receive it and we're reminded of it today. And we thank him. And one of the greatest ways we can thank him is to worship him, to worship him for what he's done for us through Jesus. Will you stand with me?
as we stand, let's, uh, let's just bow our heads and pray together. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the wonderful, awesome, amazing work of Jesus Christ. His amazing grace, your amazing grace for us on, on our behalf. And we thank you for the lives that you've changed. Maybe if he's changed your life, just take a moment to thank him right now. We thank you for the lives that you're changing and the work that you've called us to here in central Indiana. I pray that daily as we realize and understand your grace more and more for our lives, that we would be willing to extend that grace to others. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his blood. Thank you for his resurrection. Thank you for his righteousness for our lives and for all the hope that we have in him. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.